Welcome to NAB 2011. Hi there, I'm Kirk Harnack on the Twit Network. Leo and others are on their way to go do some live interviews uh, out in the field, so to speak, with the, uh, the Live View uh, camera backpack. Uh, we're welcoming you to NAB Coverage 2011. And I'll be here uh, for another half hour or so uh, while, I'm, you know, while those guys are setting up for their live shot. And I'm really pleased to have with us uh, some broadcasters and broadcast engineers from the other side of the world. It's the middle of the night for them. So let's right here to my to my left. We got a camera shot on him. Yeah, this is Simon Jackson. Hello. Hi, Simon. Hello. How are you? Kirk? Welcome in. Thank you very much. Good are, to be here. Are you awake? Uh, not really. No. <laughs> no. Never really. We'll talk to Simon in just a moment. Also, we get a get a wide shot and uh, and oh, these other gentlemen. These here we have from uh, from left to right on your television screen. Igor Zakina. Hello. He Hello, Igor. Hi. You are an engineer. Yes. Right. Still. So you can you can talk you know real bits <laughs> bits and resistors and capacitors and yeah, all I that can stuff. Talk about this. Yep. And next to you we have Rob Harling. Hi Rob, how are you? Hi Kirk. Have you Thank and you. I shook hands before? We have. A okay. Of times. Where at? In in Australia. In Australia. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm you know being in Australia, I might not have been entirely sober. <laughs> Possibly not. Glad you're here. Welcome to the Good show. To be here. And, uh, and uh, so Rob's from Australia, and representing India in the show is Elliot Steckman. Okay, good morning. You don't sound like you're from India. I'm far from it, mate. Far from it. <laughs> <laughs> the closest thing to India to me is the food, and that's about it. All right. Well, good to have you here. You you uh, are an engineer. That's your background in yeah, India, right? In engineering background, mainly in IT. Okay. Um, but certainly do a lot of broadcast these days as well for some of the major networks. And you know what? I just realized both Igor and Elliot have been on the This Week in Radio Tech show so appreciate you guys uh, thanks for having us so uh, we're going to talk a bit about broadcasting um, in uh, down under and I, I want to cover first this uh, this thing about the earthquake in, in Christchurch and it toppled buildings it killed some people yeah it did. and uh, but tell us about broadcasting and what were broadcasters able to stay on the air were they able to get back on the air well it was interesting uh, no a number of those none of the networks ended up being off air and uh, it's been a real uh, struggle to get them back. Um, interesting enough, we've been lending equipment as ABC Group to a number of uh, broadcasters, and uh, Axia has been very helpful, I have to say, in getting some new consoles and things really, really quickly down to Christchurch. And yeah, it's been an interesting time, and people have been operating out of uh, back bedrooms, and uh, and there's been a lot of sleepless nights with some of the network engineers. It's been wow. a very interesting time. Wow. So what does what Christchurch need now? If broadcasters are, are on the air, what, what's going on as far as rebuilding there? Well, I think um, trying to get back into buildings. Um, we've got a number of broadcasters who can't actually get their equipment. So they're using lend, loaned gear. Oh, uh, so, so they, they can't get to their studios. Yeah, well, some of the buildings are actually okay, but they're in centers where it's very dangerous to actually get to. So we oh. have like a large hotel leaning across um, precariously. One of, the, one of the studios there for a, for a station called Tahu FM. And so, yeah, they're, they're operating out of, a, out of a back bedroom, literally, of a house uh, with a jury-rigged STL and using a, uh, actually a TELUS product, a, um, a zip codec to go all the way back to Auckland, then go to a satellite link, then go back up to, uh, to a transmitter. Oh, okay, the, the Zephyr IP over, over the yeah, internet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From the, from the makeshift studio That's right. to Auckland to an uplink site. Correct. So they can get the audio to the transmitter sites. That's right. And so um, Carlin wow. of Carlin Goodwilly from Christchurch is watching at the moment. He's, um, he's an avid Twit, twit follower. Um, yeah, he's been working some long days and long nights trying to get it going. But it's, you know, I think everyone sort of really just rallied around and sort of did what they had to do to get back on air. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Craig Vores from uh, Radio Works, I know, has had some sleepless nights. And uh, Frank Wilcox from, um, from TRN also. Right. Is, is, you know, these guys are working very hard trying to, trying to get back going again. But sobering, but then I guess uh, Japan happened and we just felt, goodness, how lucky we are. Wow, yeah, thank yeah. goodness. So, yeah. puts it all in perspective. So, uh, there's another project that has happened uh, a couple of years ago in New Zealand. And in fact, Igor and I talked about this on, on a uh, torch show. And that's this, uh, this Mori uh, network. Oh, the, the, Maori, the Maori network. This yeah. is uh, Punganet. Yeah. Punganet. And that was What's interesting. This? You know, we, we, it, was, it was quite eerie. We, the, the link never went down to the Christchurch station. And we could hear the return feed until eventually there was just silence at the other end because the essentially the UPS ran out because everyone had, had rushed out of the building and left oh. alone. Oh, that was that was quite fun. But yeah, that, that technology stayed working. That's all using Telos iPorts. Um, so to 21 stations around the country. 
That was very interesting. That was, um, and since then, we've, we've gone and started looking at high availability hosting for our switching center. Because right. it's, we're thinking, you know what, that, that could happen in Auckland. We, we, don't, we don't worry about earthquakes, <laughs> but you know, there's about, I don't know, 100 volcanoes, <laughs> essentially. Every hill you look at is actually a volcano. And, and, and they're not dead, they're just dormant. Uh -huh. So yeah, uh -huh. so we, you know, which way is the lava going to go is our concern. So yeah. Is there anything fine. else happening in New Zealand in broadcasting that's of note right now? Uh, well, the sheep are a very good audience. <laughs> okay. um, they're spending a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. F 15 sheep for in, in New Zealand Look, for every listener. I have right? to say, New Zealand, is, it's not a lot happening. We, we're a bit distracted right now. Yeah. Uh, however, in Australia, I tell you what, Australia going, what recession? Yes. So they didn't notice. And in fact, uh, I'm, I'm glad that Rob's here because I want to yes. ask Rob about Australia Broadcasting and more specifically about this DAB Plus. What, tell us about what's happening in DAB. Well, first of all, a lot of our audience is US based, so yes. DAB is not real familiar. What's DAB Plus? Basically, DAB Plus is based on the European standard, Kirk, um, but modified for Australia. Our Socialist digital radio. <laughs> That's right. We, um, what we're doing differently is that we're using AAC plus encoding in Australia. Instead of MPEG-2. Instead of MPEG-2. So you can get a uh, great sound with a lower bit rate. Okay. That's the theory. Yes. Right. And we do. We yeah. do. The thing that we're seeing, though, is that, and the thing that troubles me, is that the bit rates are being reduced and reduced. Ooh. And um, so the quality, Ooh. while we're still running AAC plus, yeah. the quality is acceptable, but it's, um, it's disappointing that it couldn't be... It couldn't be better. You know, every every business like this has what we call bean counters, and yet they serve an important function because we do get paychecks. But there's always this tension between the engineers. No, no, we got to keep this at this bit rate. No, we got to put more channels in here to serve more people, there's, more there's, interests. There is a bit of that happening, is and there? um, there's also limitations just with the government regulations. We've been assigned a fairly narrow band for DAB, and. Right. Um, because of the way DAB operates as opposed to HD radio, which is tagged onto an FM channel in, in right. the US. Um, DAB is a one multiplex, um, does all. It, is, so it being, is this one multiplex being transmitted from several locations about a city? In, in our case, it's one location. One location. And in, intent, you're, you're in Brisbane. We're in Brisbane, yeah. Okay. So it's one location and all broadcasters run from that one multiplex. Or in our case, there are three, there are actually three multiplexes. One assigned to the the government broadcasters and right. then two others to commercial and community broadcasters. So, um, but we have very limited bandwidth really in that. So what kind of, uh, well first of all, how many programs are you running? We're running just one. One, and As, what kind well, of bit rate do you get? We're running, currently we're allowed 64 kilobits in the market that we're in, mm -hmm. but dependent on the market and the demand, the bit rate varies. So it's anything from, um, in some cases, 40, 42 kilobits up to um, 96 kilobits, and, depending on the market. And which exact flavor of AAC are you using? Um, we're running AAC Plus. Okay, so it's AAC with spectral band replication, yes. uh, but it's not the HE AAC. Not at this stage. Okay, can can they ever switch to uh, more efficient codecs as they're available? That's a good question. I, I think the standard uh, Australia lobbied the DAB uh, body, the, the European body, to uh, utilize the AAC Plus uh, compression because of the narrow bandwidths we were running. So at this stage, I think that's where it's sitting. Um, as to whether we can upgrade that over, over time, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how transportable that would be. It would depend, on, I suppose, on, on the receivers. If the receivers Absolutely. can be either updated or can handle If, if they could be coatings. updated remotely, then possibly mm. so, so it, whether they're hard-coded or soft-coded. But I think at this stage, the product I'm seeing is all hard-coded. Is a, is a DAB Plus receiver just a standalone box or a portable? It uh, can be anything you want it to be. So currently in the market, um, what they've done, uh, companies like, um, uh, I'm just trying to think of some of the manufacturers that are around, have taken basically a, a DAB product, a European product, and just put the different, the, the, the AAC algorithm, okay. decoding algorithm okay. in. So the product looks very much the same as the European product, and for that reason, you, the costings, the, the manufacturing cost is not as high as it could be if it was a standalone product for Australia. So if, if you've got one of these radios and you're, you're tuning it, how, how, do, how does one tune a digital radio? That's a good like question. This? What, what I found is generally you scan the band when you get the, the radio, it okay. scans, brings in channels, and then it's an up or down thing or a preset. So it's like the Cirrus or your, your digital yeah, radio having yeah. cars here. Okay. Yeah, really, okay. really no difference. And our, our rental we've got one. Now, so you're still doing FM broadcasting Absolutely. too, right? Yeah. Are there combo FM DAB plus receivers? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. There's, 
it depending depending on the manufacturer again, but it seems to be that that's the way it's running. Is that they'll provide an FM receiver as well as the DAB receiver, so it makes it a little bit more attractive to buy that. Now, I, I wouldn't think that this is terrifically popular yet. You've only had it there for what a year or two? Um, yeah, a couple of years now, I've been okay. running, and it's. Um, According to the commercial radio figures, the commercial radio organisation in Australia, uh, CRA, they claim that um, the take-up has been much greater than they expected. So they, their figures, I think the last figures I saw on that were in the order of 200,000 receivers, where they assume we'd see 100,000 over a year or two. Huh. And uh, while they're small numbers compared to the US, for Australia that's that's a reasonable figure. Sure. Have the car manufacturers got onto it yet? Are they installing no, the not, cars? No, not so far. No, it's, I think it's a, a case of seeing how the uh, domestic receiver market plays out and then I think the car manufacturers will adopt that. Are they talking about a digital turnoff for FM? In no, Australia? no. The idea, the whole mindset with uh, digital radio in Australia is that it's, it's a, it's a supplementary thing. Right. So, what, uh, what, there is bandwidth for the commercial broadcasters to um, replicate their their FM broadcast as well as adding extra channeling for the not-for-profits, the com the community radio stations, which I'm a part of. It's just a case of providing alternate programming. So um, the station I'm looking after that I'm a, a chairman of, we run a, an FM program that's a, a certain flavour and what we're doing then ultimately for digital will be running an alternate to that. And it will be sort of our second peg demand, as it were, uh, running on digital. Wow. So um, um, how many cities across Australia is DAB in? Is it taken off across the country? It's Perth, for example? The, um, yeah. It's all capital cities, Kirk, so okay, okay. Uh, we're talking, for those who don't know, Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth, and um, Hobart's been left out. Hobart, the, the capital of Tasmania, at this stage, uh, because of some issues there, I think they've left that aside for the moment mm -hmm. until they get the rest of the capital cities running. Now, who runs the, the multiplex transmitter site itself? The, the, there was, there was uh, a number of deals uh, put forward by various uh, facilities, as it were around Australia, there are two main parties that provide transmission facilities in Australia. Um, a company called uh, TX Australia, who tend to be owned by the television companies, and uh, they, they provide primarily uh, facilities for television broadcasting, but they also provide other bits and pieces. And Broadcast Australia, who have um, basically contract for the government broadcasting okay, sort of things, okay. and they also have facilities for so, those. So these guys aren't necessarily broadcasters, and they're not the government, they're third party companies that provide a transmission service. Correct. And then do broadcasters such as yourself pay a fee? Correct. To be that's on it. that multiplex? That's, that's the way it works. And oh, well, interestingly okay. enough, it's what, what's happened is Broadcast Australia has won the contract to do all of the uh, DAB transmission, but they're using TX Australia facilities to do so. <laughs> okay, okay. That interesting arrangement, I don't know how they've done that, but that's between them. Uh, so but they're it's all for profit though, aren't they? they that's, that's right. <laughs> Somebody's making a markup somewhere. Wow. But it's an interesting thing that um, uh, all of the television facilities, of course, have been horizontally polarised antennas, and they found with DAB Plus we needed to run uh, circular polarisation okay. or mixed polarisation. Yeah. So all of the antenna facilities around Australia have been upgraded to have mixed... What, uh, what frequency band is DAB Plus it's, on? It's running uh, Channel 9A in the analogue band, so uh, effectively it's around... Um, Look, uh, forgive me for getting this wrong, but around 190, 200 megahertz. I was going to guess about 200 megahertz. Yeah, in that sort of so range. does it have decent building penetration? Um, it's reasonable. It's I, I think uh, the initial predictions that they had 10 years ago for DAB um, proved to be, in, in practical testing, they needed to bump the power up by uh, 5 to 10 dB. Okay. So it was a significant improvement, a significant increase over the predicted coverage uh, powers that were required. So there's been quite some changes there and they're running reasonably high power transmitters. Here's a, it, I'm, I'm usually not a green kind of guy, you know, I mean, hey, power, let's put it out the tower, you know. But I, I would think that digital broadcasting is actually kind of green compared to analog broadcasting. Is the power level lower for a similar coverage area? It, look, it is in that we're, you're running one multiplex. It's typically, if I recall correctly, for the area that I'm in anyway, it's five kilowatts. So in, in the sense, yes, you're and running And this is one, for all the stations that's combined. That's for all the stations combined. Yeah. So in that sense, it is green, yeah. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. Rob, thanks very much for that update. In, anything else you want to tell us about Australian broadcasting? No, interestingly enough, Kirk, we've, um, I think our part of the world has suffered quite a bit from uh, natural disasters. My part of the world, we've had floods. 
and flooding right. was uh, quite significant. So listening to Simon talking about earthquakes in, in uh, Christchurch, we've had flooding through Brisbane and one of the, the stations that both of us or all of us have been involved with, um, their basement went under. Now their, their, their studios were on the fifth floor, but um, in terms of um, operation, they couldn't access their building similar to what Simon's saying. So they ended up living in our backyard uh, for oh, some time. Yes. So it's been interesting how the broadcasters have helped each other out. And the same sort of thing, we've taken, we've actually had uh, Axia product helping them out to get them up and running. So oh. um, it's been an interesting time in our part of the world in the last uh, six to eight months. Oh, geez, geez. All right, well, I want to move on to um, Fiji. Uh, not that this guy's from Fiji, but it, you, you, you might as well buy a house there, right? Well, yeah. You probably yeah. have an apartment there. Igor Zakina, Igor is part of the AVC group, and he has an engineering background. I, Igor's uh, AVC has been awarded a, a large project in Fiji. Yep. Tell us uh, kind of the scope of this project, and then let's talk about a couple details. Okay, there is the National Broadcaster, Fijian Broadcast Corporation, which we awarded the full uh, refit of their studios. Should I go a little closer? Yep. And uh, this is including the six channels, radio channels, which they broadcast from that building, and uh, as well as future television channel, which is just about to come out. Ah, okay. And including also transmission sites across the country, uh, microwave linking, and um, an upgrade of all those. Now, I got to visit this facility, the, the radio facility there, and you know, uh, Fiji for years and decades has been fraught with a lot of political battles, and so it seems like there's the infrastructure for broadcasting has been uh, let to decline yes. over the years and years and years. Well, that current investment is um, it's the largest investment in actually history of the Fiji for for that purpose. So it's really a major thing for everyone there. So in, in the radio facility, how many studios have you rebuilt? Okay, there? well, uh, they have, um, they, as I said, uh, they have six programs which six. are running okay. uh, on three different languages. Um, and. Um, including the, those six, which are main studios. There is additional, uh, altogether, basically 16 studios in that building. Uh, the technology which we are implementing there is all based on uh, uh, IP audio, which right. is uh, by, by Exia. Yeah. And um, that also includes the television studio, so the, the Exia sound is uh, carried also Oh, you're using, I, you're using IP audio mixing consoles for That's the correct. television yes. as well. Yes, so entire facility. I mean, we yeah. made this decision because just integration is much easier. And also the studios can be cross-used between, uh, there are dedicated studios only for, for, for radio and also for television, but they can also jump across uh, to the radio studios and basically integrate everything. We, we integrated the, the uh, SDI uh, uh, Evert um, uh, switcher to be controlled also by XCR uh, Pathfinder. Okay. So that all can work together and we can actually control and integrate everything very easily. So, is the radio studio project finished at this point? Well, the radio studios is uh, basically nearly finished because they are still fighting. The biggest challenge there is that building which they're renovating, it still needs to basically provide the uh, hosting for being on air for other wow. studios. Mm -hmm. So, part of the building was uh, kind of finished and then, then the studios were moved, actually installed new studios that they moved the program there. And the current, currently they're finally fin finalizing the basically another um, three studios and television sites. And hopefully, when I come back from NIB, <laughs> we'll start to install the television part. Right. Yeah, right. We've, we've told Igor he's not allowed to come home from Fiji now <laughs> until it's finished. It's been a really challenging project because it's the South Pacific, but it's a beautiful place to work. Absolutely. And I'm just concerned he might not actually want to come home. No. I but, moved there. Uh, I can think of worse I'm Fijian now. <laughs> You're Fijian now. <laughs> well, there's something else about this project besides the studios that I find interesting is when, you know, this, this place, Fiji, you've got, you've got transmitter sites all over the, the country. To, yes. Because it's very mountainous and there's several islands, right? Yeah. yeah. So you don't have one master antenna to cover oh, the whole no. place. You've got to cover oh, no. with, how many transmitter sites are there? Well, there are yeah. seven main transmission sites. Right. Um, so the t biggest challenge was actually to interconnect them because currently they are really running FM just off air repeating. So we also did as a part of separate project the uh, the frequency planning for the country. Now b yep. before you did this mm -hmm. replanning of the frequencies, was the, was the, were the frequency allocations just a bit haphazard? <laughs> well, well, yeah, it, it was just an interesting bit. concept <laughs> how somebody decided the channeling works. 
Um, but yeah, so basically they ran out of, of available frequencies just because how the plane was that lower and upper, so they allow this of air re receiving and and you know even even the national broadcaster don't have uh, in whole country uh, frequencies for all six programs. So this is now changed and and it's basically very beneficial to everyone. Is is that a big? Uh, uh, I mean, how do you do that? Do you, do you get a map out and draw circles and figure out where channels are going to go so that they work with each other? How does one make a band plan for a whole country? Well, you do. You, you use computers today for that. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. that actually helps a lot. <laughs> Definitely. <You know? laughs> so there is the software which actually provides you the interference analysis, analysis and, uh, and you basically when we did that, we actually looked at, because the one of the requirement was you know, to provide as every country as much as available frequencies as possible. Right. Right. Uh, it is very challenging in, in Fiji because it's a relatively small uh, area. It's um, very hilly and uh, the population is really uh, in the coastal part. Right. So we try to do the 400 kilohertz uh, separation, but we end up with the 800 kilohertz uh, model. It's all basically based on ITU recommendation. So this is what we did. So they end up now with, um, with all current um, providers or, or broadcasters are actually accommodated in the national uh, plan and there are still additional four uh, channels available nationally. And you, you wouldn't think a small country like Fiji would have a problem finding frequencies for all the broadcasters. It's it's not that densely populated, but you mentioned that the terrain is a problem yep. and everybody's living in the coastal areas. But also you said earlier that there are six programs going out in three different languages. Yeah. Now, well, help me understand, why does a country like Fiji need three languages with each with two different programs going out? Okay, well, there is a... Um, current situation is there is a, uh, around 50% of uh, uh, native Fijians, which is uh, the Fiji native language. Um, there are one program which is official uh, uh, government funded uh, program, RF1, Radio Fiji 1, which broadcasts in that language, and also a commercial part which is called Bula FM. Mm -hmm. um, then uh, another, most of the 50% um, is uh, Indian, so the Hindi is the language uh, which is uh, also official there. And um, the two stations, uh, Radio Fiji 2, which is official government uh, funded station, and uh, uh, Mirchi FM, which is similar name as, or same name as in India. They borrow it, I'm not sure who, from <laughs> who, but yeah, okay. And uh, official Engli English language, so there are also a couple of stations, which is uh, basically classic hits station, yeah. uh, Gold FM, which is my favorite, actually. And uh, they also, uh, the the, for young people, um, today FM. Cool, cool. And another broadcasters, this is government uh, ABC, also basically broadcast there, and they have similar concept with six or five stations across the country. So frequencies are all gone. Igor, thanks very much. And I'm told okay. that we're getting ready to uh, wrap up, but I want to real quick hit Elliot here. Elliot, you're in India, yeah. where private broadcasting is only, what, about 10 or 12 years old now? 10 years this year. 10 years come, this year. Come July, it'll and be 10 years. Is there something big going to happen called phase three? Oh, that's a million dollar question. Is it going to happen? Million dollar question. What does it mean for India if phase three happens? If phase three happens, there'll be another 800 licenses, FM licenses that will go out across 800 the new radio stations. Oh, that's, 800 will be available, oh, depending okay. on okay. The, the, the number that the broadcasters actually bid for. There's various issues that the broadcasters and the government are working through at present to get to phase three. Uh, one is the, the, the major one that's really taking the, the stand at present is the, the way that they're actually going to uh, auction the licenses. Um, earlier it was a, a bid, you put it in an envelope and they opened it, uh, but the government recently has had very good uh, success with an e-auction. Uh, mm. India's just got 3G telecommunication speeds and uh, that's, uh, they're, they're keen to go that way as well because they think they can get better, more money for it. I'd like to see if maybe you guys can come back another time, but we're going to have to go right now to uh, a live broadcast from Leo. So we're going to wrap this up. I'm Kirk Harnack, and I've been hosting Simon Jackson, Igor Zakina, Rob Harling, and Elliot Steckman here with us on the Twit stage here at NAB 2011. So uh, we ready to go? Uh, Darren Akato is coming up here. Hey, Darren. Darren's an old friend of mine. Hey, good to see you, Alex. Good to see you, too. I don't know if the headphones are working. You can try. You got little pots here. Oh, let's let's see. You're the one who taught me how to like have a real radio voice. Get up close. Nope. No, no. See if you can turn some of those pots up and see if you get any reaction here. I'm not sure if they. There's something wrong with the pipe. Yeah. All right. Um, the. Uh, so have you seen anything cool? Yeah. 
very, very cool. I mean, uh, it, it's only the first uh, like couple hours, but I, mm -hmm. I spent a lot of last week looking at things. I'm gonna move you closer to that mic. Just, just, just uh, yeah. Like that. Go. I spent a, a lot of last week looking at different things before they got to uh, Vegas, and then over the weekend, I'm already exhausted. Yeah. So and, so, and I haven't even hit the floor that much yet. Right. But um, I think one of the the coolest things. Um, on like the big picture side is the the F65 that oh. Sony has. So Sony, so Sony is an F65. This is a, it is an 8K sensor. Yeah, that is then down sampling to 4K. Is that right? Exactly. It is. Um, it's about 20 megapixels. The uh, the array is. Can I? Re I guess I can reveal this. The array is turned <laughs> diagonally. So diagonally. So, yeah. That what? that way you're getting you're getting all the green. It, it is a bear type of okay uh, C it's CMOS but you're getting um, all the green the green pixels in that photo site but you're getting twice the amount of, of red and blue wow. so it's result it's incredible you know what it's resolving um, I saw the pictures of Curtis Clark um, over at the Sony booth they're screening the film uh, and existing light shot with the new Leica lenses wide open it's it's Gore, amazing. Low, low grain, really sharp. Noise floor is so low. Um, back at back at Sony on Wednesday, um, they showed me one of their images just of the dark uh, uh, dark sky. Blew it up. I think we blew it up like ninety percent. And looking at what the what the noise structure is, it it is so quiet. Yeah. Well, part of that's uh, oversampling. So you're exactly. taking that large image and, and shrinking it down. Now, for those of you watching, uh, uh, people who are, 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 are coming in from uh, watching Twit Live, Darren is, of course, a, a DP, uh, director of photography, uh, in, in, uh, and former, former president, right, of, of uh, your, your, uh, your term over? Uh, yeah, I did three consecutive terms, terms. as uh, like president of, of ASC. Yeah. Um, uh, also, I'm here. Um, I'm a uh, member of the um, Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Right. Their scientific and technology council. Right. So they pick 25 people to serve on that, and we uh, kind of evaluating the cameras. Evaluating that, and but also looking at at technology or developing. Actually, the the getting back to the F65. It's using um, a file format that the Academy came up with. Oh, really? So, so it's not a file format we've seen before. It's not like Apple ProRes it, or no. It, it's uh, it's actually it's called um, I I I I I F Aces, which uh -huh. stands for Image Interchange um, Frame in, Image Interchange File uh, Framework, and Aces is the Academy Color Encoding Spec. So basically what it does is um, it was six years of volunteer development and uh, guys coming, f color scientists from everywhere flying in, um, didn't know if it was going to be really workable, if it re really happened, but we felt that technology, software, processing was going to start to advance to the point that we could implement something like this. Right. Uh, so what it does is it takes... Um, uh, Sony, you could use it with Sony S Log right now, and justify the, the television show that Francis Kenny is shooting. Right, um, is the first show to ever use Aces in their workflow. Now, what what distinguishes this from the file formats that we already have that we're shooting with? It is a 16-bit file format. 16-bit, they can actually 16, linear or linear. Linear. Right. They okay. can play real time. Uh, what happens is uh, you take if let, let's look at this to see the S Log and mm -hmm. S Gamut. You take um, you take that file, uh, you load it up to the server, you apply. Uh, it's called an input device transform. Right. And what that's doing is it takes the file, and now maps it to the Aces color spec. So it'll take a 10-bit file, 444, put it into 16-bit. Right. It's way wider than any file well, format and, and for people, and dynamic range. And, and for people who are watching who, who don't do a lot of this, the, the yeah. issue is is that you, you know, this has been always the challenge with digital, was that film had this huge gamut right. that, we could, that we could shoot into. And so there was this huge target. And you wonder, you know, wh well, why can't they just get it right when they're on the set? Well, on the set, the, 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 the lighting's changing. The, the sun comes out. Exactly. The, um, there, you know, there's, there's a thousand things going on on the set. You don't have enough time because you're burning $100, $100 a minute you know, to be sitting out there figuring right. stuff out. And so, you know, having that, and so what happened with digital, when, it, when we first started shooting all of this stuff, 
the issue was is that you got into the situation where um, it was this razor thin target that yeah. a DP would have to hit, or you'd get blown out highlights yeah. or you're, things. You're, like. you're taking this much information and trying to squeeze it right through there. Yeah. Right. Right now. Yeah. Yeah. And, exactly. Uh, yeah, and that's you know what we look at as the, the limitations of 709. Right. Um, so, and so, so this is we're finally getting to a point where we really have all that data. Right. We you know, have that, everything to work with. Now, would you? We, how would you compare what what the 65 is doing to like? How would it compare to film? The the well, the F65 is taking aces and using that as their workflow. Right. They're going coming out 16 bit. Wow. So you get everything the sensor can give you. How many stops you. Do, would you? Uh, I personally have not put it to the test. I'm going to do it next week. Yeah. Uh, but what I saw, it's about 14 stops. And it's 14. Now, for, for people, that, what, what would yeah. you normally say film is as far as stops? Film go? is about 15 to 16. So it's, very, it's getting very close. It's getting very close, but it's also us it's usable. Uh, range from from the brightest to the darkest. I mean, right. there's a lot of cameras that have wide dynamic range or mm -hmm. latitude, but when you get into like three stops over, you you could not take that and have and it look natural. I mean, right. like this highlight might actually be blue right. or green, and there's no color information to fix it. So it's actually usable range, and what that does is it, it makes uh, it makes the camera look well filmic, basically. Right. Um, I mean, I, and I, I think that, I mean, my impression is 8K downsampled to 4K has to look sharper than film. It, it definitely looks sharper. Um, I mean, you could probably blow that up. I mean, it's 4K and you could blow it up. Right. You know, I, further than that. I mean, the, the, the you know, I, I've always been, uh, you know, leery about what all this, K, you know, 8K, 4K, 2K, 6K, 5.5K. Uh, that, you know, that to me, that's not a, the barometer of... Uh, of real resolution, right. real, to me, real resolution is: does it look transparent? Do you have color resolution to go along right. with with that? Otherwise, we could just make sensors with uh, yep. cameras with green chips, right? And right. see, 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 you know, see a lot of data. Of gray, yeah. But uh, but yeah, the the camera has incredible dynamic range sensitivity. To me. I don't think it's been measured, but it looks like it's 800 ASA without. There's no gain, no nothing applied to it. Wow. Um, and going through the Academy Aces process, you get all that information back, and you can color correct it in real time. When do when do we think you color correct it in real time? Oh, absolutely. Oh, it's man. not. Well, what what they did was you know we looked at and and that's being saved as metadata. Yeah. So you're so you you can be on set. Dialing in what you want to see, and that's going to be saved to the file. So right. when it comes back in, well, this is what we wanted when when we were in Video Village. Oh yeah, when absolutely. We were dialing it in because it's because it's the raw data is way more above and below what you actually want right, to use. Right. Right. But the, it gives the, it allows the DP and the director on set to make it just make make color decisions that are going to go all the way down the path. Yeah. Or know that you got headroom. Right. And let's move on. Right. You know, you know that you you know if a director says it is is. Am I going to see the lines right? You know, you can scroll that up. Yeah, you, I mean, yeah. you you could say, well, that's way within our headroom. Yeah, we you don't have to make that decision. You could do right. it in color correction and really paint the image. Yeah. But uh, but I have you know I have to say that 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 Aces we looked at different file formats. So rather than try to do something new, actually ILM's OpenEXR was a great. I was going to ask foundation. you, is, is that yeah. how, how it, so it's, it's, it's an extent, we extension? We built it off of, of uh, yeah, Florian exactly. was great as far as helping us with that. Right. And uh, so it's an open e EXR 16-bit float file. Yeah. Uh, why we like that is that that's sort of, that's been a, a file format that visual effects facilities right. could move around. Uh, what we did is we put some rules to it by using s defining what the input device transform is, and then we define what the output device transform is. So right. you know if you're going to a 709 monitor, it's going to give you what that right. should be. And having a 16, I've been, I've sat in on a luster uh, color correction on some test footage I did with just Sony S log. Yeah. That the F35 was like a whole different camera going through this. Right. It released every anything that uh, 709 had. It was um, it just released, opened up the camera, and I think yeah. Sony was so impressed uh, with the work that uh, 
uh, when Curtis Clark from the mm -hmm. ASC introduced, you know, said, why don't you try using aces right. on the justified footage? Because it was very moody, very dark. Right. And Francis Kinney, the cinematographer, wasn't getting what he thought he should get. Right. Um, they looked at the S log. It would just was not getting there. Right. And they just they did a test, transformed it to uh, to aces. They had the parameters to reprogram right. the luster and the base mm -hmm. light. Any software color corrector actually can do this if the manufacturers want to do it. Well, and so so we're probably going to see this inside of Smoke and inside of exactly uh, Resolve yeah. and all the other ones that are be you know right. they're, they're going to be out there. So so that'll be a uh, but correcting in 16-bit is a whole. It's like taking dirty glasses off, and now you got you yeah. got subtleties. You got everything. Right. The, the, if you want to key something, it's it's right. amazing. Right. The difference from 10-bit to 16. So now, do you, do we expect to see that file format in more than just the the F F65? Yeah. Uh, it's it's totally uh, open source. Um, I mean, for instance, do you think that they would put that? put that file format availability in something like the F3? Or is that too low? That, that Are they going to hang on to that and well, keep it on the, on the upper end? Got to get the F3 first to S-Log and S-Gamut. Right. But um, I th that is so Sony is pretty sold on, on doing that. And uh, I mean, Sony's been very aggressive. I think that one of the things that we, we've seen is, you know, it really felt like, a couple of years ago, it really felt like Red just got everybody off balance. Mm -hmm. You know, just caught everybody. They were all going down. It was kind of like one of those things where, Everyone's running one way, and then they just ran a reverse. You right. know, and everyone was like, blah, blah, blah. well, you know, like, like, and suddenly there was this camera, and it, and it just, and and they, it took them, a, it took them a good three or four years to get their footing. Yeah. You know, but now it feels like now Red is doing incredible, incredible work. I mean, when you look at the Epic and you look at the, mm -hmm. the, uh, and we're going to be showing one of those later, and and we and I just saw it this morning with Ted. And yeah, I just I was over, um, I was just trying to to check in over at. Uh, and the tent, of course, I, I, is predictably I went, crazy. I wanted to go deep first, rather right. than like start here at the FedEx office and go to Grass Valley. I went when I walked in this morning. I went deep over Came back. to see, yeah, Jim. But then I looked at the, my watch. And I was like, oh, I'll, I'll get back up here and talk to you guys first. Right. But um, but yeah, I think that this there's a feeling this year that I get that there's a maturity to this tech to the technology. Yeah. To cameras, it's not kind of like, oh, we got this here, and, well, and, and, and it's a disruptive technology, and this, right. everybody has Red their, is settling in. Yeah, exactly. You know, they're, they're, they, they figured out we can be a rebel, but there's also like three or four other things we should, you know, we got, we got, we got to yeah. conform in a couple places to Ex make this all work. Exactly. You know, and, and, uh, and then you look at Sony, I think, yeah, Sony and Panasonic, and I think that, the, I think this is the end, one of the things for me, it seems like, is this might be the end of the DSLR as a movie-making machine. Right. You know, like, Photography extended the DSLR video makes sense, but when you look at the DF one or the H or is it, um, is it DF one hundred the no, AF one hundred when you look at the AF one Panasonic's AF one hundred oh right you look the at the AF Sony's NX one hundred you know now you have these full frame sensors mm -hmm. for for a four, price four or five thousand or six thousand exactly. dollars you know and, and 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 so that becomes the new kind of you know explosion there as far as right. as far as that goes. It's it's interesting. The DSLRs, um, you know, they look they they did a they do a great job. They look cool, but you have to be digging that you want that look. Well, yeah, and, which and, the is, other, and, and the other thing is is that you know we shoot you know I have two five Ds and we yeah. shoot lots of and, and people I ask me can you make a film with these and I go oh, here's the deal if you want to make if you want to make a web video that looks like film like that looks kind of like you right know, like has that filmic look yeah. to it. It's awesome. Yeah, the shallowed up the field, yeah. all that. Do helps. I want to put that on a big screen? No, no, no not really. You know, the, the, it's too compressed. It's too, you know. And, and once again, we were talking about that that razor thin. Uh, right. That's like it's not it's, it's not even razor thin. It's like thinner than razor thin. Yeah. It's like a hair hair width thin target um, to uh, to go. I think that Eileen is. Uh, no, no, she's looking anyway. So well, well I, ha I have seen um, Technicolor of all people have done a a. Um, Connection into a DSLR to Canon. They've partnered up with Canon, so we can finally get a real, a real. They, uh, they've been opening up that color space to reach, reach even more than what you're getting mm -hmm. on that. So, so there's going to be uses for it. But I think it's good. I said I think there's. I think that, that, that I think there were uses for the photographer who is extending their their video. But I right. think that when you look at now, it to used to be twenty five hundred dollars for that look, or I'm going to spend twenty five thousand. Right. To now it's twenty four hundred or five thousand. To force that form factor and and 
it's not really designed to be a, a motion camera to go yeah. and you, to force that form factor with a bunch of brackets yeah. and everything is it's great once in a while but you're not going to want to be on set well, every day like with it kind of like it's it's taking a, it's taking a little honda accord and putting all that stuff all over oh yeah, it's absolutely like, it's like, it's like yeah the big, you know instead of just buying a sports car you know a sports yeah. car you know by the so. time you're done it it now the technology has gotten to the point where you can buy a purpose-made camera that looks like that, that yeah in that right price range exactly yeah. um and uh so yeah so you know alexa did some great things f65 spectacular images yeah. Alexa optical viewfinder yeah. on there with a four by three chip, which I had I I had uh, bet them that they would not make it <laughs> because yeah. of the price point of right. it. Right. Uh, and why bother if you're going to sell? I mean, they've sold so many Alexas. I right. mean, Alexas are going out the well, door. Are you going to be Are you going to be around the rest of the week? Yeah. So I'm going to I'm going to pull you on to some of the Pixel Core stuff as well. Oh, absolutely. We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll, so we'll, we'll, there'll be more of this. So as as you and I are going to continue this conversation. Sure. Because I, so, I I want to check out some other things and. So uh, maybe Wednesday we'll get get you back over here. Yep. When, and uh, and yeah. we're going to be doing some walkabouts. When we go into the camera area, I want to have you. Oh, that would be you, great. You and I will go walking. So we're going to do that every day. Okay. So, so maybe maybe tomorrow. Just yeah. Tomorrow. Okay. I'll, I'll send you a text message. And yeah. We'll, I, we'll I have out. an academy presentation on LED lights of all things. Oh, there it's you go. Not all what, not what all. it's made up to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At 4:30. Okay. Okay. Um, so we'll we'll figure that out. Before that, yeah, that'd be so great. So if you're watching, you know, some of the Pixcore streams next, tomorrow, we'll have we'll we'll go out there and and uh, check that out. Cool. Thanks a lot for stopping hey, by. My pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. It's a blast. All right. See you later. All right. Take care. So uh, we've got another guest coming up here. Uh, Robert is going to be on his way up. And um, before we get to him, I'd like to thank Squarespace uh, for their. Uh, we have uh, Robert Hummel uh, from oh from Legend 3D. Great. And uh, as he's coming up and getting getting situated, we want to th of course thank Squarespace. Squarespace, of course, is the easy way to build a website. Uh, if you are if 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 you've been trying to figure out how to build a website, you don't know how to do any HTML coding, you don't know anything about servers, you don't know how you're gonna put this all together uh, and how you're going to code it and put the, you know, how to build that, uh, you can just simply go up to Squarespace. It's WYSIWYG. This is what my, if you go to bordersack.com, if you go to uh, dvgarage.com, uh, you know, all of those things are sites that we've built that are, are actually, um, these are just all on Squarespace. And we put them together. And what's great is we'll sit on Skype with uh, one of my producers and we'll sit there and, and uh, I'll move something and hit save. And then she'll move something and hit save. And you can just decide exactly what you want it to look like. Um, and it's, in, it's inexpensive. Uh, it is easy to use. Uh, it is, you know, you're, you, you would normally be paying for a server. You'd be then trying to figure out how to install it on the server. You'd be then figuring out how to keep it on the server or how to move it. Uh, in this case, all of that stuff's taken care of, care, care for you. It's in the cloud. Uh, it's just, it does all the things you need it to do. Um, and so definitely check it out. If you have been stopped uh, by, you know, I can't create my blog or I can't create my website for my restaurant or my business, uh, all of those things, if you've been stopped in those things, Squarespace is the place to get started again. So um, check it out, squarespace.com slash twit. That's squarespace.com slash T-W-I-T. Uh, we really appreciate their support. And if, if this is something that you've been thinking about, the time to, to go check it out. That's all i got to say. Thank you very much. Robert Hummel. Alex, I'm a fan. Ah, there you go. You got the, <laughs> is that the, uh, and that's the, uh, oh, that's the, our, the, our the Mac, Mac, break. Mac break stuff. You save, save my life sometimes working with uh, Final Cut at home and things like that. Fantastic. No, seriously. Tell us a little bit about Legend 3D. Oh, well, Legend 3D was started a few years ago by Dr. Barry Sandrew. Uh -huh. He uh, had a company called Legend Films. Uh -huh. Interestingly enough, similar name. It, right. uh, they, they, they did a lot of colorization, which okay. I'll reserve comment on that part. <laughs> but, um, but they moved on. Uh, yeah, they, they were very successful at it. Uh, what he found was with when 3D uh, was I'm starting. I'm bringing you a little closer to that mic. Can, if, can, if you loosen this, this little knob down here, you can. Or no, just, pull, just pull that mic a little closer to you. There right you like that? Yeah, there you go. Live from NAB. This yes. is, uh, there you go. Um, is uh, He found that the algorithms he used for colorization, where you need to define all those edges that you're going to color, well, right. they have direct application to converting something to 3D because right. you need to f find where all those edges of, exist in, in Z space, the, yeah. the, the depth part. So uh, that became the foundations of Legend 3D, and uh, I got attracted to join them because they're all about quality. They really are about wanting to do the best quality looking so, conversion. So this is an automatic. This is a semi-automatic conversion. Ah, uh, only the first part. Okay. You know, whereas um, other companies that they they send them offshore to place, have them manually rotoscope and find all those edges. You like, you'd send five minutes. Generally, Alex, it'd take about two weeks to get it turned around. Right. We send uh, five minutes. We have a studio in Patma, India, that's using these algorithms. We get them back in about 36 hours, the five right. minutes. So, okay, that's the first part. 
right. the rest of the part still pretty hard, <laughs> <laughs> which is the uh, actually designing the depth and and really right. applying that uh, gr uh, direction. Now, how is it handling things like so? One of the things that when you're starting to do 3D conversion, it's it's all fine and dandy to cut everything out, but once you've cut everything out and you put it into Z space, you now have an issue where. Uh, when things start to move, there's parallax, and now you have new parts of the background that don't exist. Yeah, so every frame kind of becomes like a little miniature matte painting. You right. have to do photorealistic matte painting. There's some other tricks you can do. That becomes part of the proprietary part. But the right. really cool stuff is they're using other techniques, which several companies are using now, too. If they, The ones that do it really well you are getting really good volume to the objects because you don't want to look like planar flat cards floating in space, which I think we've seen before. Uh, this stuff, like we did the conversion of Shrek's 1, 2, and 3. Uh -huh. And it's kind of startling because that. Well, no, and why did they choose? It, it's, it's always interesting when you think of the, like, it's a fully animated film. Why didn't they just re-render it? Well, uh, it, it's true 3D. because you know Shrek One is only ten years old, and you know the digital files are completely compatible to. Oh wait, no, they're not. <laughs> so right, so Shrek, that's why Shrek One literally was scans of the two D film elements that were that right. were converted because. PDI had done the original Shrek film for DreamWorks. They changed their file format and worked. And, right. and on two and three, they basically found it was going to be less expensive to convert it. And I'm telling you, I'm really proud of the Shrek stuff. You look at it, it looks like it was rendered in 3D. Right. Uh, Shrek has his bulbous head, has absolute volume to it. It's, it's startling how, how good it looks. And I, I assume that that's the secret sauce of how you get the volume back out yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah. So it's going to cut it out. And then there's lots of ways of using some of the channels and tr yeah. figuring and out the, what you're, if, what's actually if, going if on. If your audience is really smart and do some searching on the Internet, you can find there's a professor up in the northern Midwest who discovered this about 10 years ago, right. how you can do this kind of technique and create this illusion. And the, you're able to do it. This is I always get asked the question, well, that's, well, that's not native 3D. No, no. What you and I see, that's native 3D. Stereoscopic. 3D is an illusion. Well, it, and, and, it's, and, and, it's, and you're constantly changing that. I mean, one of the things is, is that we, we think that, oh, we're going to shoot everything at two and a half inch interaxial, but that's and not. You pretty much almost never shoot it at that. You're yeah. really shooting at 0.5 to 1, maybe yeah. 1.5 yeah, if you're for getting you, downright Alex. crazy. A lot of people don't realize that because it's an art form. Stereoscopic, right. I mean, I worked on Captain EO and Muppet Vision 3D, so I go back a ways on this right. stuff. And one thing I've always understood is it's not the way we see things in real life. Right. I mean, when, when, when great filmmakers have said, so tell us, why are you doing it in 3D? And they go, well, it's because of the way I see things in real life. Um, maybe they see things in real life that way, but not you and I don't. It's so you're basically trying to mimic the stereoscopic experience you have in real life, where in real life you and I converge and we focus constantly interconnected. But when you watch something in 3D, your focus is fixed on the display, be it a screen or a TV set, and yet your convergence is moving. You never do that normally. Well, and, 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 yeah, and one of, and one of the... One of the uh, advantages of doing it in post is that we don't have to make some of those decisions that we would otherwise have to make because the issue is is you screw up the interaxial distance uh, on set and there's no way to go back and you're, and, you're, and you're gonna have divergence in the background you're gonna have issues that you can't so divergence by the way if you're watching it's if I if I if my interoc interocular interaxial distance is too far apart and then I I look at something too close I converge on something too close in the background, that image, they will, it'll form an image that you could possibly resolve, but you would probably be cross-eyed when you did it. Well, you and know, that's, you why, that's when you go, oh, it hurt. Um, that's part well, of it. And you touched on a good point. Because in real life, when you look at that object that's real close, the background goes double. We, right. we're, we all know that. But interesting, when you watch a stereoscopic movie. You can't have that happen. Well, because your, your brain tries to put it all together. Right. Because I have a nice quick time I put together, which I'm happy to email you if you want. Yeah. It, it was, is that, that illustrates why 3D stereoscopic is not an optical process. It's not. Right. Right. It happens in your brain, in your visual cortex. And uh, I had an image scientist from Berkeley last December just explain this to me. It's akin to uh, when we have astigmatism in one eye. Right. And you don't know about it until you go get your eyes checked. Right? Because it's correcting for Because it. your brain is basically merging that distorted image with the undistorted image. It's doing a great <laughs> post-process where it's replacing some of the information from one camera to the other one. Yeah, it's, and automatically, in real time. It's, it's amazing, but yeah. actually the truth is you see a softer image because of that. And then when you get glasses or contacts that correct for it, oh, now suddenly it's much sharper because you're right. correcting for it optically. But it's that same technique that your brain's going through to join these images. Because your brain does that, we can create the illusion of depth with like, two cameras, or we can do it by, by taking a single image and, and modifying it. And as you probably know, there are several shots in Avatar that were done this way, you know, a dozen or so. Um, we're working on a movie right now where it's literally checkerboarded, stereo capture with 35 millimeter anamorphic film. We're converting all the film elements, and it's indistinguishable. You can't tell when, where one starts or the other. Now, ends. what 
what are the co how does this change the cost structure of a film? Like, how much does it cost for using your technique to convert a film? Wow, from, that's a good question. Because, like, I'll be honest with you. If you're doing an independent film, low budget film, this isn't going to be what you want. I, th I think you want to shoot it that way. Well, <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 typically, I mean, the, the numbers that I've heard are in the vicinity of fifteen to twenty five million. You know, those are the oh, you know, to we c we can get as low as seven to eight. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah so, so well, the, the one we're doing right now is. Towards the number, the, the, the up to towards the twenty million mark, and right. it, and we're not even doing the whole film, but we're probably doing about ninety minutes of it. Right. And uh, uh, and, and and the thing to remember is that when people look at that, is like, oh, that's a lot of money, twenty million dollars just to convert to three D. But look at how much more you're you're getting. Everyone's getting charged when they go see a three D movie, and then you think about the added revenue that's coming in, and, and the math that somebody's doing in Hollywood is. The 3D version will make us X amount more. Yeah, and we'd love to say that it's an artistic thing, but there's a guy that's writing a check that says, "I if it makes 40 million dollars more with a 20 million dollar investment." Exactly, then Alex. And, and these are films that are costing 200 million anyway to, to make as a movie. You exactly. Know, which you're not you're not converting little films to yeah, not yet. Uh, but the truth, that, and you didn't ask the question, but are we getting better? Yes. Like this film, which is. Very challenging. I won't make my voice crack again, but it's very challenging, and we've developed tools that we didn't have two months right. ago, right. and as a result, we, we're seeing we're getting more and more efficient. So with time, the conversion is going to get less and less expensive. Though, if you're making a film for five million dollars and you want it to be three D, you probably want to shoot it that way. Though, right. though, being said, there's probably isn't a, these days a film that's shot in three D that doesn't have stuff that's converted in, because invariably they have one shot where the right eye was out of focus or the left eye was out of focus so you only have one good eye so you end up converting that eye for those you know as fix it shots or we call them the 911 shots we get calls for yeah absolutely well and and I think that I think as we start to see things like the like the Panasonic 3D A1 the Sony you know 3D camera you know we're, I think we're going to see more independent filmmakers trying to just do the side by side it won't be as good you know there's a lot of things you give up on that I I do think that I I become a con convert of the beam splitter <laughs> so but, you know but the beam splitter has its problems too you know it the does. camera so that you, shoots through that through, through the glass through through the glass it's shooting polarized light yeah so when you go outside and you shoot you've got reflections on windows windshields bumpers one sees the reflections the other camera doesn't well and not only that you get into the situation where we, we were t we were at, I was at the Sony I don't have you I don't know, there's a Sony has this little class and we went through this little class has what a class on 3D production for okay. For, for oh the, yeah. Oh uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I know it very well. And the um, but something they brought up that I hadn't even thought about. It was like, oh right, if you have a CMOS, remember one, it's scanning. It's not. It's not like a CCD that's that's punching. So a CCD for those of you listening, when you charge it, in charge couple device, it it goes like this every frame. Yeah, it dumps the entire charge out of all the wells of the of the photo sites where CMOS it's a rolling shutter. So it scans, it scans yeah. down the um, you know, it's scanning from the top to the bottom or the bottom to the top or whatever it is. The problem is is that you you go into a beam splitter and that's all fine dandy when everything's next to each other. You go into a beam splitter and you've turned one camera and now one camera is essentially scanning the opposite direction as the other oh, camera. Oh, I never thought of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 the, you know, so the, so that the um, so the CMOS sensors uh, will, you know, one scanning the one way and one scanning the other because they've been they're they're re reversed. And so now, if you get jelly, a little bit of jelly vision, which you might not notice, it's a problem because in stereo it's really jelly vision. Yeah, I, and and so they're mismatching out. Some of these cameras now are they're getting to the point like the I think the new Sony F3 and some of the other ones are they're actually putting it in there where you can change the way the CMOS is scanning so that you can match these cameras back together. That's quaint. I, 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 in a prior career, a couple of years ago, I was president of Dalsa Digital Cinema, which is a 4K right. camera back then. And Dalsa makes really great sensors. They just were a bit challenged when it came to making a camera right, package. Right, right. But um, uh, you, you, the Dr. Savas Chamberlain, who has a lot of the core CCD and CMOS patents in his name, the right. original ones way back when, he can just bore you to tears of why you don't want to use a CMOS camera in a motion picture camera. You want to use a CCD yeah. because you've got motion involved. You just want to get into that. Well, and I and I and I have a we have a um, uh, a Sony F950. Uh huh. You know, in the office, that's my that's my little house camera. That's quaint. And uh, yeah, and um, and uh, all 1440 pixels of it. At, uh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and the, the but the, the funny thing about it is is that the uh, you know I keep on thinking this is the last time. This is the last year I'm going to use this camera, but it's still it's a CCD HD 1080p 444 camera, and I keep on using it because little things like oh right uh, with the CMOS uh, with the bear pattern, uh, the iPad um, will uh, alias, like when you're shooting it with a CMOS camera. Oh, then you're just not using a very good debearing algorithm. Well, but that's what that, yeah, but that, but that camera is that's what you know. So we, we with some of the cameras that we were using with CMOS, and we we're like oh we'll go back to the CCD and then we're fine, you know. And uh, so that's you know but. 
these are all the things that we keep on making a lot of these, uh, you know, we think that everything's even, but when you really get into these fine details and when you start integrating these cameras, that these little things that kind of didn't work. No, you hit on it, really Alex. A lot of people think like, you know, what, and it relates to 3D, what we're talking about is that a lot of people tr think digital is just like film, but it's digital. Right, right. No, no, no. It's entirely different. Yeah. There's so many aspects of it, you know, that, you know, like, Every time you fly with your digital camera on an airplane, pixels die horrible deaths on your camera. <laughs> and this is a known thing in the, in the industry is that the gamma rays induce voltages above 10,000 feet in your cameras, and they fry pixels in the process. There's, There's nothing you can do about it. You require about 120 feet of shielding to stop those gamma rays. And that, so far, the airlines keep refusing to carry 120 feet of concrete. <laughs> uh, you know, it's <laughs> that, those guys. It's ridiculous. You know, they're, they're, you know, they're not but, thinking about us. They're just thinking <laughs> about them. But... I, uh, I learned this when I worked at Sony years ago because I was complaining. I sent my Canon A1 digital camcorder for the fourth sensor replacement over warranty period. And, and the guys at Sony said, well, Hummelson, uh, are you ever flying in an airplane with it? I go, well, yeah, when that's I go to Hawaii. You know, and, and they said, oh, well, that's the problem. The, the Sony, Panasonic, JVC, they ship all their still and digital cameras by boat to North America and Europe for Just that for reason. That. Wow. Because you know, you're so when you take your camera on a plane, just know that you're going to introduce you know dead or illuminated pixels. That, uh, oh, you know, I I I I did not know that. I, and see, and we take our oh, you take our little. I don't take the big camera on the plane very often. We take our little <laughs> yeah, EXs. Yeah, nine fifty. I don't think so. No, <laughs> which, I have, I have <laughs> taken it on a plane. Uh, it, and 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 you know what's funny is is that when I brought it back, we had to we had to deal with some some. Uh, some sensors. Well, but also we had F950s. We, we were a camera rental house, and we had software from Sony that was designed specifically to map out the pixels that died as a result of this. And what happens is you reach a point where suddenly you can't map out the pixels anymore, yep. and then you have to replace the whole sensor. Yep, yep. No, we, and we came back, and I had a friend of mine who's an engineer, and, and I sent it over to him, and he had the software to clean that up. We've gone off totally the 3D thing. I could bore you to tears with digital camera stories. I know. Well, <laughs> we're just moving all around. Now, so now, here's the thing is that obviously this is your business. Uh, where do you think 3D is going this year, next year? I mean, do you think we're going to start seeing a real expansion? Is it still going to be something in film, or are we going to see a, a real ex expansion in, I, in home theater? Well, I think you're going to see more films. I think uh, the fact that people are now seeing after the, the backlash that happened last year, I think that everyone kind of thought that 3D was a piece of crap, but everybody seemed to forget that Alice in Wonderland was in, entirely converted and entirely with, had different creative reasons of how it was done. Everything in Wonderland, I thought they just rendered... Uh, all of Wonderland and only converted the people. Much to my surprise, I learned that no, all of Wonderland was converted. I have a friend who worked on that. Yeah, yeah it was, so it's, it was, it was kind of startling, and it looked really good. I thought it looked good. I thought it looked a little card-like at times. Well, you know, there was a little bit of like those a. Those were different companies where you saw that. <laughs> That's always the best part, by the way. As, a, as someone who does visual effects, we do visual effects, and you always want to have a couple companies work on it because anytime there's a bad shot and someone says, "Oh, there's a bad shot," I was like, oh, oh but I, but I'm. No, I'm being very sincere to you on that because, like, the bookends of that movie were done by N3, and it has an entirely different creative. It absolutely right. looks plainer and card-like. Right. N3 says that was a creative decision on part of Tim Burton. I, I and okay, I respect him. That's it's his movie, but I found it distracting. Uh, and those those the real world stuff before outside of the right. uh, rabbit hole, it was just so plainer. It was it was distracting and it looked right. bad. But uh, so so my point is, it's getting so much better now that now people have more choices. 3D itself, though, for TVs. I don't hear many people saying this, but I think it's going to be sports that take it takes off. Cause sports and, and, and events. Yeah, the, because because now does that remotely the way we see real things? No. In real life, in football, the only guy that sees it in 3D is the ref. Right. If you're sitting in the in the in the sta stadium, you're not seeing it in 3D. But people like this hyper stereo you well, get. Well, and, and then you, and, and you end up and, and and the thing that people don't realize is that when you're doing it in football and you're and you're way up on the rafters, you're taking those two cameras and you're putting them. Way apart from each other, they're yeah, not. They, they're not sitting they have, next to each other. They're like having twenty-four inch intera interaxial. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's pretty because that's the only way to get a three D feel. Because the reality is, is that our three D diminishes pretty quickly after about twenty or thirty feet. Oh, closer to twenty. Yeah, I usually <laughs> say I was being conservative, but yeah, I, I always just say if it's if they're more than we were talking about shooting. I was talking but to someone about shooting safari, and I was like. So here's the deal about the safari <laughs> thing. I was like, I was like, you know, if I'm shooting a line in 3D, you know, I I, I just want to be in the truck. You know, you know, it's because it's when I was at Imagineering, we had this guy before we did uh, uh, Honey, I Shrunk the Audience. This guy come in to give a lecture about 3D, so we can understand. And he said, monocular depth perception trumps stereoscopic depth perception. Our brains, monocular is more important. That's why in a 3D movie, you don't want to have an off-screen object get occluded by the edge of the screen because it'll immediately recede back. 
because your brain goes, well, if it's getting occluded, I'm gonna it move, can't. I'm going to move my frame of reference. Because well, it's gonna, your brain goes, it can't possibly be coming off the screen right. because it's occluded, so it must actually be behind the screen. Now, you're still getting the stereoscopic cue, but your brain will push it back because your brain knows better. And he said that's because you don't want the, the saber-toothed tiger to get within 20 feet of you before you know it's getting closer. <laughs> <laughs> that, Always a good tip. <laughs> so, so, so you wonder why, why we have frame violations. It's because we don't want the saber-toothed tiger. Yeah, so, but it's interesting. I think the sports will cause it to take off because... It's a fact that big screen TV sales always spike before the Super Bowl. Right. Okay, so, and if people really like 3D and they enjoy that, well, in, in some ways, I, I have to say is that I think that, that, that a lot of times when I'm looking at, like, what, what do I find compelling? I find a lot of events and, and being there stuff sometimes more compelling than watching film. You know, like, you know, the film 3D is great, but the problem is with film 3D, I'm cutting all the time, I'm moving back and forth, I'm doing all these things, and it's, it's very challenging. And there's a lot of things that you, we do as filmmakers that doesn't necessarily make sense in 3D. You want to have slower edits. You want to have, you want to linger a little bit longer. You want to... Good for you, Alex. It does change the vocabulary of cinema. Oh, you're, and, and you're, the, you're the, the most right. valuable thing that I did was I bought a Fuji... W3. Oh, I got a W1 and then I got a W3. It's a little snap. Fuji oh, makes yes. that little uh, you, 3D you camera. Just the right distance. You don't need to wear glasses. Uh, yeah, yeah, right yeah. yeah. You just, and, and, um, but the thing is, is I started just taking, we were starting to get into 3D and I started taking pictures with it. And suddenly I realized, oh, that doesn't work and this doesn't work and that works and this doesn't work. And, and, in a, in a, and I very quickly saw that the entire process of making a movie eventually if you really want to make a 3D movie, you, you want things to be more centered. You want things to be well, longer it's moves. It's odd that Jim Cameron did 10 years of homework and Avatar turned out so well, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> you know, it's, it's just like, that's, I got such respect for him that he yeah. didn't just dive into this. That's why Avatar is such a pleasing film at two hours and 45 minutes, whatever it is. And, you know, oh, and, he, and he played it safe. You know, yeah. he realized we're not, gonna, we're not here to show off 3D. We're here to tell a story, it's, and it's we're going to exactly. add something to it with 3D. Exactly. Um, you know, and I think that that was the thing that was really important is that, is that we're not going to, you know, because, again, we're not going to stretch your eyes. We're not well, going well, to. I find it know. ironic when people, you'll get a re read a review of a 3D movie and going, well, there really weren't many moments where things came off the screen. It's like, wait a minute. Right. It's a story. You're right. supposed to do things in service of the story, not to do it like the way as House of Wax, where they're uh, and, doing and, the paddle ball, you know, coming off the screen at and, you. And most of the time, and what, what was really interesting is, is that, you know, in real life, we oftentimes, we either, if, if it comes that quick, quickly, we usually blink. <laughs> you know, and so the thing is, is that one of the things that you got really good, we started realizing with the, the 3D, we were playing with a 3D A1 as well. We were shooting, Panasonic lent it to us to, to go out and do some tests. And, uh -huh. you know, I go like this and it, it just doubles. I go like this, and it just reaches off the screen. And you so know, all of those things are, are things that, that you have to start rethinking how you make movies. Peter Anderson, who's a god when it comes to 3D cinematography, has worked on pretty much every Everything, theme park yeah. film. And uh, uh, we did this on Captain EO going back in the early 80s. Captain EO starts with this astro. In fact, I guess it's playing in the Disney parks again. The, right. They're showing you, so you can go see it. The opening shot is this asteroid that slowly comes, and it's slowly coming. Why? Because it's basically teaching you what your eyes need to do for the next 15 minutes or so right. as you watch the movie. Uh, I understand Terminator 3D, which I haven't seen, but I understand it starts with the, 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 the liquid metal guy's head comes slowly. Up, and it's, it's these things. You try to look for those moments in 3D because you have to kind of tell your brain, okay, you're going to start seeing things that you're not normally used to doing. Otherwise, if you do these real fast jumping off, you're right. You'll see double because you're... Yeah, and, you, and you need time to resolve that, time to figure that out. And, I, and I, I, uh, we, we did in the Sony training that we were doing, they took a, just a, a yardstick and pointed it at the camera. And when they got it right, it was like literally I was sitting in the front row of the theater and it felt like I could just go like this. <laughs> you know, like, like it just felt like I, I can just touch it right here because it was just so, you know. Yeah, so when you do it well and you spend that time to allow, allow the brain to follow those But it really is. And, and Sony has been investing an enormous amount of energy. Um, you know, this is a, oh, they Buzz, have a, Buzz Hayes does an amazing job down there with that Buzz whole school. Buzz is just, I, I, you know, I, I, I really, really enjoy it. The, um, uh, yeah, but, but the whole program, they're so open about it and Buzz right. is very clear to people how that, 3D being an art form, you need to really learn it and understand it if you're going to leverage that medium. Yeah, yeah. So it's, I think that, you know, and, and they, they, they brought in 1,300 DPs so far. To, or 1,300 people have gone through that program now. I didn't know there were 1,300 DPs in Hollywood. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> they're just getting started. They're just, well, I, they're, well, they're coming in from every, when I was there, there are people from Pittsburgh and Kentucky. Oh, yeah. and, you know, every, Local 600 has just kind of been working with Sony to make sure that everyone knows how to shoot it so that we're shooting good, good 3D. So Thank goodness. Be exciting. So you're, you're here on the floor. Do you have a, you have a booth? Uh, no. Okay, you're no, just. I'm here on the floor, yes. You're here wandering <laughs> I'm the floor, moving all over the floor. But your company is Legend 3D. Right. 
and uh, and so we'll uh, we'll I'll definitely check it out. And, and, and we'll, uh, thank you for helping me solve problems with my Final Cut setup at home. I appreciate it's it. It's my pleasure. And when we we're about to get we're, we're working on starting a new 3D um, podcast. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so that's outstanding. So we're gonna um, so I'll get you. We'll, we'll talk more about that. Okay, great. So thank you oh, very it's much. Really nice to meet you. All right.